Hello, movie lovers. Welcome home. My name is Amy Henserling, and you are listening to Watch This List. This is a very special episode of Amy's Progress that was quite difficult to make, actually, because Adam and I's uh, concept of time, uh, much like the concept of time in this film, was off. Uh, and we have rescheduled this session three different times, I think now, Adam. So the fact that we are here is a bit miraculous and I feel, um, is the perfect time despite how many just absolute interruptions and (laughs) just out of nowhere happenings happening. So Adam, I am pleased that this worked out. And I know that this was a movie that you wanted to do a couple of months ago, right? This was like something that you were thinking about before yeah, you that's suggested right. it. Yeah, Th- thanks for having me back, uh, Amy. Of course. Um, when we were discussing the first episode that I did with you, the Comfort, Comfort Movies episode, um, you had you were uh, plotting to get Amy's progress happening and, and you mentioned that to me and you wondered whether – we should record one of those instead. And I think I'd already kind of attached myself to the idea of comfort movies and I said, oh, well, let's go with that. But, hey, who knows, maybe we could do do one of, you know, an Amy's Progress at some point. I don't know that it, it even had that name at the time when you mentioned it to me. Right. And I was just thinking about it um, after we had recorded our uh, comfort movies app and I guess um, – you were particularly at the start of Amy's Progress looking at a lot of religious and sort of overtly, I guess, spiritual in the sense of Judeo-Christian sort of films and not necessarily having a religious background. I wondered about other kinds of spirituality, other kinds of spiritual cinema, um, and I guess also cinema from non-Western backgrounds as well. Right. Um, And that's where Memoria came to me um so yeah yeah that was uh and so I mentioned it to you and that was some time ago now um and but we've just been chatting about it subsequent yeah Yeah, and then you did you really love it very much when you first saw it I get the impression that it it didn't it like it's hit you at different Mm. levels right upon rewatch Okay, so here's my story of the first time okay. I watched it. Um, I'm ready. I, I did really like it, and I was fam- I was familiar with the filmmaker, uh, Pichapong Weiris Ethical. Uh, I'd seen a number of his films before and really liked what he did. And I was it, there was a huge level of anticipation. I'm not sure about for you, but I started hearing about Memoria months before it came out and heard about the fact that it was only going to be released in cinemas and that they wouldn't they were never going to do streaming or blu-ray because it had to be seen in a cinema which you know is no longer the case a bit of, bit of a ruse because there are blu-rays yeah. you can buy and I watched it yeah. on streaming um but hey it got me to the cinema to see it in the first instance but so when it screened uh here it screened as part of our um international arts festival Mm-hmm. And all of their their film program um, is all screened at this beautiful outdoor cinema. It's called the Somerville Auditorium. It's at our oldest university. There are huge ancient pine trees lining the sides of the cinema. It's a really, really beautiful space and it's a really lovely place to go and see films. And I was, you know, had massive anticipation to, to see this film. I went and saw it on a Saturday night and... So it's an outdoor cinema, about 250 metres from the uh, cinema, there is a restaurant um, nestled in this really gorgeous, very expensive part of town um, where they have, they do often do weddings and functions. And -hmm. there was a wedding happening that night. And it was a pretty still night, but every once in a while there would be a, a drift, a gust of wind. And so... Memory is the kind of film that seeing it in a in a completely silent environment is probably pretty important to getting the nuance of the sound, the dynamic between really loud and really soft and virtual silence. There's a lot of silence in this film. And so every once in a while, just drifting over from this wedding, we would get the house music. So we'd hear like Single Ladies by Beyonce or like Girls Just Want to Have Fun just drifting <laughs> over 
and it was incredibly <gasps> distracting. It was really, yeah. it was really, it was virtually impossible at times to focus on what was happening on screen. So I was very distracted when I saw it the first time. Knew that I really liked it. There was obviously a lot there um, that connected with me, but it was not the ideal circumstances. So um, it was only since going back and actually being able to watch it, you know, in and ironic that it was uh, touted as they sort of said, oh, well, you have to see it in a cinema. And then for that reason, we're not going to do a, you know, home distribution or whatever. Um, and I actually was actually watching it at home and being able to watch it. And actually I uh, went back and listened to, oh, actually watched several scenes um, I, again uh, in preparation for this episode with headphones. And yes. that was, you know, that was optimal uh, environment. So, yeah, anyway, that's my, that's my story. So connecting with it again this time, the, I, could, I felt as though I could actually really immerse myself in the film and it really, you know, improved it considerably. I wasn't able to see it in the theatre either and I had massive expectations because Mike D'Angelo gave it a perfect score or at least had said, like, that it was an experience and that it really needed to be seen in the cinema because the hush of, you know, other people and like the reverence that was sort of paid to it mm. was ideal. Um, but I saw it too at home with headphones on and I still felt very transported. Mm. Like I definitely, and maybe even more so because I was alone. So there wasn't this expectation and, and yeah. nobody could ruin it by talking or, you know, Absolutely. having all these outside distractions being there. I think so. And it's also a film that is about, you know, the journey of a single character. And so being in that a very solitary mm -hmm. mindset to, to travel with that on that journey with that character, I think is a perfect env environment. I was thinking too, like when you had first suggested that we cover it, I thought uh, you and I talking about the movie, like with someone who's hearing us talk about it, who hasn't seen it is very similar to her describing the sound. Right. To her. Sure. Name. Like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Like her trying to say, well, it was kind of like this and it was kind of like this is basically mm. what you and I are doing right now or about to do. Like we are going to be trying to describe a sound. Yeah. And trying to tr translate an, yeah. an inner experience. Exactly. In, in outward means. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's kind of a, a noble pursuit. I feel a lot of times the movies that end up being on Amy's progress or my progress, it feels weird to say Amy's when I'm here but uh it, it's it feels like they're daunting like they're they're like significant movies that are moving and powerful and have their own sort of weight and but I think that we'll be able to do it as much justice as it can be I hope so it's not a film that has a lot of outward plot machinations mm. yeah but I think there's so much to it I really do. And I think it's a very open text as well. So I am really intrigued to hear your perspective because I feel I brought a lot of myself to this viewing. Um, and I think it's the kind of film that you really can pour a lot of yourself into. So tell me, not exactly a plot summary, but if you could describe the film and the way that you take it, like, it's about this woman named Jessica, but then like, could you describe the way that it unfolds and the way that you felt that it did? Because I know there's a lot of different interpretations to how people sort of would even describe the plot, but mm. I'm interested in how you would. Well, I mean, I think the second half of the film, it, it's kind of a, a film of two halves. This has been noted by other people and even by the filmmakers that the first half of the film takes place in the city, the second half in the country. Um, and so there's a movement from one to the other. I, I, there's also a mirroring that takes place as well. We have two characters, one in the first half, one in the second half, both named Hunan. Um, yeah, Hunan. I, you know, I, I have an, interp an interpretation of who they are, 
Um, maybe I don't know if we're going to want to quite want to get into that just yet. Um, I guess also I, I just what do you think about the because often on these episode on Amy's Progress episodes specifically you will say we're going to spoil the film. Do you think this we is are. a film that can be spoiled? Well, yeah, I think uh, just don't hesitate to get into whatever you'd like. I'm sure. going to assume that if somebody's listening, then they don't mind. Mm. And there is a reveal that happens at the at the very end of the film, um, which I actually had spoiled for me by another podcast before I saw the film, which pro- possibly also, you know, affected my initial viewing of it, but going mm. into it again, knowing it was there, but without the sort of anticipation of like, oh, when's that going to happen? Actually kind of knowing the layout of the film and almost sort of being having a feel for the landscape of this film, um, it, it, it was less of an issue, I suppose. Um, okay. It no longer felt like something that had been spoiled, I guess, because it already had in a way. Um, right. But your, your your original question is, where do you, where do I sort of see this film going? Um, well, look, I guess let's just talk. A, a, I'll, I will use the plot just to sort of lay that out for us. So, I mean, I have also said that, you know, it's a very open text and there's not a lot of plot. And there's also not a lot really explained to us about who Jessica is, what she's doing in Colombia. All we really know is that, She's there. She's an orchid farmer. She um, is is not necessarily a native or a you know um, an ex even an expat necessarily um, long term, but she's there. Her sister is there. Her sister is ill and in in and out of hospital, so she's visiting her hosp- her sister in hospital, uh, but also spends time with her outside. Uh, I was never really sure until I rewatched that she is actually staying in her sister's house um, yeah. because you never really see her in the house with uh, her sister has a husband and a son and you never see them interacting in the house, but it but does become apparent that the, she is staying in the house with them um, because she makes reference to this noise. I guess th- that is the main driver of the plot. That's the plot hook for a lot of people is she has what's been termed exploding head syndrome which is something right. that a Pitchett Pong uh, experienced himself and that was the basis for writing the film. Right. Um, and so she has this noise, this bang or a thud or a, yeah. It's that, like concrete hitting the water is what right. she describes That's it That's how she yeah. describes it, exactly. Um, and she has this noise that just sort of occurs randomly. Uh, and the way that a Pitchett Pong discussed discusses it or has discussed it um he said that it was never really anything that kind of bothered him it was just sort of there and we get the sense although there are i mean that the film opens with her waking up kind of suddenly because she hears that noise um but then it happens a bunch of times and there are some moments in the film where it really bothers her noticeably and then there are others where it's just kind of it just kind of happens and she barely sort of notices it and right um and and he said and i read something where he said that he wasn't necessarily interested in like when he had the idea or the conception for the film it wasn't that he was uh trying to say what it meant what the sound meant it's more what did it signify mm -hmm. like what could what could it mean Yep. And so the there's like all these different interpretations that you could have throughout of like, is she going crazy? Is, is it just like lack of sleep? Is mm-hmm. there like uh, extraterrestrial interference? Is it mm-hmm. like uh, something to do with her sister's undiagnosed illness? There's like all these different sort of implications that aren't actually articulated. Mm-hmm. Um, but the whole thing is like, what not necessarily what the origin of the sound is, but what does it mean that she can hear it? Uh, yeah, I'm just going to go out and say it. For me, um, the sound is a manifestation of her trauma. I think mm, that Jessica interesting. is. Um, uh, I, I think she's dealing with pain, grief. There's there's 
a, a single moment, there's a single line where she's sitting with her sister's husband and he's mm-hmm. helping work her because she's not a na- uh, n- native Spanish speaker and he's helping her with some official documentation, potentially right. visa or a loan, At a lunch. business loan or, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, and he makes reference to a character called Paul. Uh, uh, she, she, or she does perhaps, she says to him, he's talking about, oh, they're going to need this kind of documentation in order to progress whatever it is they're talking about. And she says, uh, do you need, do they need Paul's? And he says, yes, especially to the death, the death certificate. Sorry. And she says, oh, it's fine. And that's the only, only reference, um, in the film at all. I mean, you can interpret that. Uh, in a number of different ways. We're never told who Paul is. It could be a husband or partner. It could be a brother. Um, it could be a business partner. If this is a business loan, that later on um, the character of Hanan offers to help her, assist her in buying a refrigerator where she can store orchids because she's an orchid farmer. Right. We have no idea, no way of knowing who Paul is. But I read Paul as an important figure that she has lost um, in her life. Um, I read the the sound as a manifestation of her sense of loss, her sense of grief, trauma. Um, Look, I think this film, I mean, for me, this is, you know, me putting a lot of my stuff on it. Um, I think this is and possibly why I chose it. Um, This for me is a film that's about staring into the void uh, mm. and staring into the void is really wondering what it is that your point and your purpose is in life. Um, and I've been doing a lot of that the last year or so. And that is why I think I was really drawn to thinking about and talking about this film. And, but I also think that that's probably why I put that interpretation on this film, because as I said, it is because such of where a, you are. Exactly, exactly. And it's such an open text. So what do you think of that interpretation? I like it. I didn't I didn't really consider at all. So I'm glad that you have brought this in. I didn't consider at all that it had to do with grief. I uh see the sound as a um almost like a siren call where the it's leading her to where she ends up. Yeah. Like, um, I don't really know how to, it's almost like if the GPS in your car chose an address and then the sound were the map. Mm -hmm. So the sound is leading her to the, to Hernan's home Mm -hmm. at the end Mm -hmm. so that that they can have the moment of like intense empathy and her, Mm -hmm reliving his memories and mm-hmm. speaking them out and having that experience and then hopefully finally being being able to get some sleep but i i see it as like a guiding force rather than connected to trauma right i see it as like leading her to a place where she can find some sort of resolution and know what it was for but based on be, that experience can it be both though can, sure, can, Adam. Can your can your that's you bringing trauma, it in? Can your trauma <laughs> lead you to the place that you need to be? Right? Is is for me the film is about her working through that, right? And so mm. I like your interpretation of of what that sound signifies. That's uh, yeah, a siren, a siren call. That's beautiful. You know, it's leading her somewhere. It absolutely like right. she she follows the sound for sure, and yeah. it takes her right. to Hanan definitely. Um, I also feel as though through that that process of her traveling from city to country and and moving towards where she ends the film, she's also working through whatever it is that we're never never really given any explicit discussion of or explanation of, um, and that's yes, yeah, uh, that and that's, I think that that's she... for me w- what the journey is about. Um, I think you're right. Enough, I'll, can I just throw in what, uh, a quick quote from a picture pong? We're ethical. He said, we shot the film chronologically and we were just little by little trying to find this lady. So they were trying to find he and Tilda, 
and the rest of the crew were trying to find Jessica and find who mm-hmm. she was. And I think she's trying to find herself. Um, uh, Tilda Swinton talked about, I'm not sure if I've got the quote in front of me, um, not necessarily being lost, but being almost in a state of limbo perhaps. And yes. that's why it's, I, I, I think it's important that she's in a country that she's, you know, she's not familiar with. And I also think that it was important and, and they've spoken about this, um, that it was important that Tilda and Epichipong make this film in a country that they were not familiar with. Neither of them were familiar with. Um, they had a sense of being lost. I'll, I'll just read you another quote where he says, um, I just wanted to work with Tilda in a place where I don't feel comfortable and don't know anything. It's a way for me to be a kid again and to look at things with the eyes of wonder. When you don't know how to get this and that, you just stop controlling. Mm. And, and another another thing that I think the film is about is just giving yourself over to the universe and just sort of, yeah. Um, surrendering. Surrendering, yes. I think it's a film about well, surrender. Well, it, it was his first feature outside of Thailand, Mm -hmm. which I think is notable. And um, her name, I don't know if you know this, Mm -hmm. that he named her Jessica Holland after the main character in I Walked with a Zombie. Right. uh, The Turner uh, film from Mm -hmm. 43. Mm -hmm. And and so there is this um, sleepwalker-ness about her because she's like, chronically unable to sleep Mm. yet she appears to be sleepwalking through her life Mm. and she it's almost like there's like a dual purpose here where she is trying to become more conscious and more aware but then she also is in like this very dreamy state where she's just so tired and like almost it's like when you're so tired that you are impressionable just because you don't have the energy to fight it. Mm. Like when she sees the doctor and she's trying to get medication Mm. and she's trying to describe her condition and the sound and everything, the, the doctor's reaction to her is she, she brings up like Salvador Dali and is trying to tell her to just believe in Jesus and that she, she shouldn't get hooked on drugs. Um, Which is kind of funny that like, uh, she's basically just saying like, I just want to be able to sleep. She's not even necessarily trying to diagnose or figure out the problem. She's literally just trying to get to a stasis where she could even like take on the things that are happening, which mm-hmm. I think is so representative of what we do on autopilot. Like, we are just like, oh, well, I'm just trying to get through the day mm-hmm. rather than coming at life of, I'm actually trying to figure out what's going on, like right. what's going on with me internally. It's more just like survival mode or reactive mode instead of hang on, like maybe I should be thinking about what's going on and how odd this is, you know? Yeah. And the doctor says to her that by medicating, she'll no longer be moved by the beauty of the world or by its sadness. Uh-huh. Um you know, the, the beauty and the sadness. I mean, that, you know, that you could, you could take that. I mean, a very, very literal interpretation is, you know, a- antidepressants or other kind of, you know, medication to sleep will dull Numb your senses. Or dull. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And so what do you think then, I mean, we're jumping around a little bit here, but what do you think then about the, uh, the moment that she has with Hernan at the very end where he, well, in his house, where he gives mm-hmm. her the, um, uh, the, the liqueur. Um, and that almost, uh, it almost acts as a, as a gateway in a, in a, in a sense. Um, because right. it's, it's almost antithetical to what the doctor is telling her. Like, don't medicate right. yourself. Right. Um, right. I lo- I looked it up. It's most likely something called Aguadiente, which is a Colombian um, liqueur that's uh, made from anise, star anise, anise flavored mm. flavored liqueur. Um, like a lot of different, um, yeah, uh, you know, li- liquors that are that are made, um, you know, moonshine style in in various you know countries. Like because he makes it, uh, Hernan makes it himself. 
Um, right. So I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I was curious about your interpretation of, of that moment because he gives her the shot. She takes a shot. Uh, she's a little res- reticent at first, um, mm-hmm. but then she asks for another and she says, um, she refers to it as, oh, this is a good human invention um, because she had been talking with Hanan about, um, he says to her, uh, I remember everything, so I try to limit what I see. And he says, right. um, experiences are harmful, right? He, he's sort of cloistered away. He's almost a hermit in a sense. He, we get the impression that he doesn't leave this small town that he's part of. And she, she sort of says, well, what do you do with, your, with yourself? Um, wouldn't you be interested in television, for example? And um, he says, uh, n- you know, no, no, I'm, you know, it can't tell me anything. It can't give me anything. It can't give me experiences that that um, would have any value for me. Right. And then shortly thereafter, yeah, they're in his his home, and I see the the liqueur that she drinks very, very shortly thereafter. Um, she also gravitates over towards the uh, the reel to reel player, um, and she, it's almost as though she channels sound through that um and i think there's a um a theme of transmission Mm -hmm. she acts as a transmitter um for his memories for his experiences Um, she's described as an antenna an antenna yeah yeah Mm -hmm. i actually thought of uh laroche and orlean like taking the orchids and and snorting them right you know at the in adaptation right where they take where they take the flower and then they make it almost into a drug well it is into a drug and then they get high off that and then they have these you know otherworldly sort of experiences i mm-hmm. thought of that and her being an orchid farmer just sort of made it ironically like that that was the case um but i thought of like yeah that they're using a drug or like a something else to manipulate their senses in mm. order to access something that they couldn't on their own, which you're right. It does seem antithetical to, mm. to what the doctor what she saying. said. Right. But, um, that is what the sound is though. Like the sound for her is something that is outside of herself and outside of her own mind that is a phenomena that enables her to have an experience that she couldn't otherwise manufacture. So I think this, I think the liqueur is in line with how this movie is structured Mm. to, to bring her somewhere. Mm. So she's like being led Mm -hmm. as opposed to just using her own powers or her own means to get there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, I see it as useful as opposed to harmful. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a, yeah, I I guess I, yeah, I use the word um, gateway. It's a, it's a, it's a, yeah. A means of her to sort of move again, where she needs to go. She's been on this journey and it's almost like it's the, another part of that, of that journey. It's like a portal. A portal. That's the, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. 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 But what do you think, Adam, of, the way that the way that the movie ends up unfolding is very interesting because it's not that these things are leading her to contemplate anything about her own life. It's using it in a way to connect with someone else Mm -hmm. fully, Mm -hmm. which like, you would think in a normal narrative or like a typical narrative, the supporting character would come in to help the protagonist realize something about themselves. Mm. Instead, it's the other way. We just met this mm-hmm. guy mm-hmm. who could be an older version of the sound engineer who may or may not exist. Mm. And then um, she has this like intense intimacy with him. 
uh, to where they're like literally one person, almost like one mind, yeah. one memory. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you think about that choice and that emphasis? Like, how does that strike you? Something just occurred to me while you were talking about the two Hernans. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I hadn't made this parallel before. And I don't necessarily know that it's was was conscious or not, but it's a bit like uh, the two characters in Lost Highway, right? The char a character disappears and then reappears in another in another body. That's right. You're right. That's a um, great connection. Yeah, uh, and I, inexplicably, I mean, look, yeah, inexplicable. And they're very different films, and I don't know that. And they're, they're very different. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would. I would need a little bit more time to actually think about uh, what the connections might actually be, but it just occurred to me. But here's what that's I, a great connection. Here's what I think um, uh, that that moment in particular is about. And and you're right, Jessica is almost a shell of a person. We are given almost nothing about her, and I mean, if you if you needed any further proof that Tilda Swinton is just like the best of the best, he, here it is because she can take this character that is drawn so thinly on the page. You know, there is mm -hmm. there is just nothing there in terms of the dialogue of of who she is, and and we're like I said earlier, we're given almost nothing about her and actually make her a fully fleshed out human being, a character that we're invested in and we want to spend time, we want to spend over two hours with. Um, and she's, there are very, very few scenes that she's not in. She's pretty much constant in the film. It is her, yeah. it is her journey. But then, yeah, at the end we're given these, uh, Hernan talks about in small snatches, very small snatches, um, but she becomes a, a transmitter for a moment in his life, hiding underneath the bed. And she see, she's in the room, she sees the bed that, you know, 30, 40, however many years ago he hid under. And I think that's about, I think that moment in particular is about two things. I think it's about um, the weight of history because I think mm -hmm. it's a very, very subtle way of, uh, expressing not only personal history but political and social history. And it's, I mean, the film is set in Colombia, which has had a pretty tumultuous political history. There have been, been various military occupations. Um, mm. You know, it's not been a peaceful country. And but there's another there's another scene earlier on where we hear the bang, but it's not the bang inside her head. She's walking down the street and it's the bang of a, of, right. a, of a bus back, backfiring. But there's yes. a guy on the street who thinks yes. it's a bomb going off or it's someone, it's shots going Shooting. off and he hits the deck and he's freaked out. And that to me is about the weight of history, right? We carry with us this lived experience of, you know, whether it's a, a military um, occupation or violence of some kind or, you know, political upheaval or unrest, or just the 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 business of being a human. You know, mm. we carry it all with us. It it all has impact. It all has weight. And so, in that moment, when she becomes a transmitter for for, for him, um, I think that's what the, the the other thing that this film is about. Which is, I mean, I mentioned her moving through trauma or grief. And I think what the film is saying that the way to do that is through connection, is through genuine human connection. Right. Um, right. And uh, if you can, um, if you can just be present in a moment with another person, that is so valuable for if for anything that you might be. If you're trying to work through something, it doesn't even have to be about that. It can be just about being present and being in the moment. And actually, because um, actually I was listening to a podcast this week, um, an interview with Emma Stone uh, around poor things, but she talked about having anxiety from a very early age, from about eight years old. Um, and she says that anxiety, and, and this sort of ties into why she became an actress. Um, she says that anxiety is about the past and or the future. Um, right. 
And you can't do anything about those. You can't do anything about the past and you can't do anything about the future because you're literally in the moment that you're in. And so all you can be is in this moment right now. Um, and so for her being present, you know, as an actor, being in the moment, doing that as a profession, she's found very helpful for hang her anxiety. But I think that Memoria is talking about the healing nature of being present in a moment and sharing a moment with another human being um, as, a, as a means of sharing that weight of history and lessening the burden. And I think you've hit on something too, Adam, with it's, it's being present, but then also presence, like they're touching, mm -hmm. like it's not just, um, it's literal physical. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something, um, I noticed a lot in the movie, the work that Andrew and I covered mm -hmm. the documentary that like the rehabilitation therapy is very physical. Mm -hmm. It's like taking breaths. It's people touching you. It's like, like when you feel rage pushing against mm -hmm. and like the, the healing power of touch. Um, even like, you know, there's so many therapies that are like this, like acupuncture or like being massaged or even, you know, physically going mm -hmm. places where people can, be with you. Um, so I think that, that it's twofold. I think that you've hit on something where it's like the active listening portion, like you and I are here right now and we're fully engaged. I'm not thinking about the past right now and I'm mm. not thinking about the future right now. Mm. It's just this. But I think another layer of that emphasized in memoria is that they are both there together that his hand is on her hand. And then when she is sort of releasing herself from that, she moves his hand mm -hmm. away. And um, so it's, it's also just like the healing power of stories, but then being acknowledged as a physical being in addition to that and the importance of that in the healing process, I think is also being highlighted. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, Til Tilda's physicality um, in this role is just incredible. The, 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 the whole way through, we mm. see the, just the way that she occupies that, well, it's her body, right? But to, to me, we're looking at Jessica being in the world. And, yeah, I, I, I referenced the weight of history, but I think there's also the weight. I feel like the way that her physical the way her body sits in the film, she's often slumped. Mm -hmm. She's often kind of, you know, and right. that might be tired, you know, being tired because she doesn't sleep, but it's almost like there's this force on her pushing her down or forcing her into this kind of, you know, she's kind of crumpled sometimes. Um, and there's the scene when she first meets the second Hernan, um, she is walking along the river bank and she, sort of leans over. She sort of, she tips her body over. It's almost like uh, recollecting it in my mind. It's almost like her legs remain completely at 180 degrees from the ground, but the top half mm -hmm. of her body kind of, you know, almost folds over. Um, mm -hmm. Like and, a child almost. Yeah. There's, well, look, there's that childlike wonder, I suppose, that a picture called Right, or the stance. References. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. And she's kind of, she's intrigued. She sort of, she, she's, she's drawn, she's being drawn. She's mm -hmm. knows that she's found something that's, that's going to give her, it's going to take her somewhere. She's choosing this adventure in a way. Well, and I think that to another interesting thing about Memoria is how the way that it unfolds um, and what it, what it, her awareness translates to heightening ours. So like the way that the film practically speaking is presented puts us in line with the, with the intention of the film so that we literally become more aware. We're even more aware of our own surroundings when we're watching it. And then I think 
at the end, when you walk out, you start to hear things uh, or you start to notice things that you might see all the time. So it's also just like this message about, I don't think necessarily appreciating your surroundings as, as just an ode to consciousness, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and not sleepwalking through life Mm -hmm. and, and not taking for granted the fact that we're sensory creatures Mm -hmm. that, that um, you could literally ignore or not notice so much of your life and, and, and it's internal as well. There's all this internal stuff going on that you could also turn yourself off to in addition to the external world. And I think the film does that in particular through sound. It's constantly yeah. drawing our attention to the dynamic between silence and sound. And there are often extremes. Um, the first scene is almost silent in that it's mm-hmm. uh, aside from the bang that uh, Jessica hears, which wakes right. her up. Um, and yeah, it's interesting when you were saying that um, w- when you were talking about a, a reminder about being present and being in the moment, you could all, you could maybe read the bang as a as a message. Hey, wake up! Hey, yes. Pay attention. Yes. Hey, be in the world. Hey, be present. Um, and yes. I, and it wakes her up. But yeah. So so this the second point I was making is is she, she's woken up and it's almost you know it's the middle of the night. It's deathly silent. There's almost no sound in that scene. And then the very next scene is. Uh, at the same time, the, the very, very early hours of the morning, it's a gorgeous shot with daylight just breaking over a parking lot and the, all of the car lights, um, uh, car alarms go yes. off and there's this symphony of car alarms. Um, and uh, a picture pong actually makes made reference to, I'm trying to find it in my notes, but I know if I can, um, a, a symphony of sound. Um, that mm. that's what he was sort of trying to create, and it's 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 fascinating to me because it is often there's I mean there's no uh, there's no score, it's only diegetic sound in the film, mm. but there is uh, a only a couple of pieces of music. There's the piece that the first Hunan is listening to when she goes into the recording studio, into the mixing Mm -hmm. studio, and he's listening to this gorgeous piece of classical music and she listens with him for a couple of moments. And that's the, uh, ties into the, the, the really interesting element of this film. It's as slow cinema or having definitely having a very languid pace. It takes Mm -hmm. its time and it really, it, 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 it forces us to just appreciate something and so we're literally just watching two figures sitting in a room listening themselves mm-hmm. and they're doing nothing. They're completely silent and, and motionless. And what we are supposed to be doing is exactly what they are, which is listening to this piece of music. Um, and the other piece of music is um, a which she goes to, I'm assuming she goes back to the same place. It's, again, it's never explained where it is. I feel like it's a um, a performing arts academy of, of some kind where Hanan works as a mixer and there there's a student ensemble playing in a room. Right. And they're playing this jazz, yeah. progressive rock jazz kind of, kind of number. And the film, it has absolutely no bearing on the plot whatsoever. Um, it's completely incidental to it. Um, it, it it's a almost a yeah it, it has it has no relation it's just its own separate moment and it holds on the image of Jessica and the other students who are watching for a really long time and we just mm-hmm. watch so we hear this music and we see Jessica and the other people just watching just being present just actually taking it in, um, actually absorbing that. Um, 
And so I think the film is as interested in the sensation of experiencing things, of listening, of hearing, of receiving as it but almost like communally yeah like as as a group yes. not just necessarily yes. on your own yeah. yeah yeah like like in in communion mm-hmm. with others and then also emphasizing the fact that she can hear something that nobody else does which i was going to this just occurred to me that this might be a feeling that you relate to where you could be having a conversation like I'm thinking of the dinner scene where she meets her sister and the husband. She comes in, she hears the sound multiple times in that dinner and just ignores it. But to me, that reminded me of how I'm in situations like a dinner party. I was just at my brother's wedding and I thought this at the rehearsal dinner where you could be interacting and you hear your own sound. Like there's something that you're aware of in the interaction and you feel is unique to yourself that you can't really convey to others and it makes you feel different. Almost like, almost like you've got this secret going on in your life where you're like, Oh, like you could, you feel like, you know, people or that you can see things beyond the small talk. And that's like that sound awareness, but you're like ignoring it in order to be a normal person. But it's almost like, I don't know, having this access to another realm of conversation that you don't feel like everybody is aware of. But when you meet people that do, it's like, oh, you can hear the same thing I do almost. Like a kindred spirit has that click where you're like, I don't feel alone in the way that I perceive things. I feel like you can hear it. And she obviously shares that with certainly the second her name. Exactly. And then they're bound. Mm. Like, it's almost like a, it's this beautiful thing of like, friendship in a way. Like, I mean, I, I don't want to get too into it. But it's kind of the cinephile thing, right? Like, we all who are friends have a language from which that we speak, that includes our passion. And we could have like nothing else in common but we would get along very deeply. Mm. I think it's that sort of phenomena in a way. Absolutely. Look, you know, um, I think art, whether it's, you know, doesn't matter what kind of art as a means for understanding the world. I mean, that's certainly what cinema is for me. It's a, it's a a space to find my place in the world and to Mm. see ideas about the world articulated to me in a way that, hopefully resonate. So when you see a film like Memoria, for example, or any other film that really, really hits you, you have that, it's that moment of connection, isn't it? And it's something greater than just the everyday, just sharing space with someone. Um, exactly. You know, or having go, a dinner going to, conversation. Going to work or, you know, right. like, yeah, hanging out with, yeah. uh, with people in any other circumstance. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, because if you contrast those interactions that she has with just like normal people with with both the times that she's with Hernan, they're vastly different and it's still just two people talking. Mm. But they they're emotionally so different. Even her conversation with her sister in the hospital is so different than this complete stranger and mm. this is somebody she's known mm. all her life, yeah. right? Yeah. So the juxtaposition of depth I think is also just very intriguing. And then in your review, I wrote down this line that I really liked that it wasn't that the movie, you know, obviously it's, it's an aural experience. It's auditory, it's heavy on sound, but you also pointed out how image and what we see is also a conduit conduit for memory. You said um, that people contain multi multitudes and can be lived in as worlds. So it's also about that when we connect and when we empathize and when we can feel one another, this whole other world opens up that is like beyond. And that's that's what I'm trying to get out here is that the sound represents this beyondness, like this um, 
outside of what we can see plane of existence. And I think that we can experience that together too. A couple of points. I think um, that ties very much into a lot of what Apichit Pong has put in many of his other films. And I think it's mm. um, reflective, you know, possibly more of, say, Thai or Eastern spirituality or philosophy more so than Western, um, this idea that there are things in the world that we don't understand, that we don't have to right. understand, that we are bi- we are part of a bigger system that not that we're insignificant. It, it's not that we're insignificant. It's that we are a small part, but that small part is significant because we we contain multitudes. We have ripples. I think this is another um, point of the film is this idea of resonance. Um, there are a couple of other points where the film talks about resonance. There's a, a guitar lecturer and he has a, an image on a, a PowerPoint slide of a, of a, a body of a guitar, right, showing how it literally creates a resonance. Um, and the film is obviously dealing with, I think, ripples of sound and ripples of our lives, memories as the ripples of our lives that continue on after a particular moment. Um, mm. The other thing that is in a Pichet Pong's films that's also in this one is people die and then come back to life. Um, There are other scenes, for example, so this definitely happens in Mysterious Object at Noon. Someone, um, yeah, just goes and sits inside a cupboard, I think, and she falls asleep and she she dies and then some kids go and, like, wake her up and, yeah, you know, there she is. She is alive again. Um, Cemetery Cemetery of Splendor, but... there's this mysterious sleeping sickness where people are basically just, you know, there's this hospital full of people who are completely in sleep and just won't wake up. Um, and they wake up period, you know, periodically. Um, and there's also a really fascinating moment in that film where it does. I wonder whether Memoria does get to it somewhat because it's talking a little bit about time memory as a Mm. conduit for things spanning ideas or our lives spanning time uh, where someone someone basically enters uh, enters a scene Uh, we've not seen this character before and she says oh i'm a a princess from six thousand years ago i'm really hungry could i have some of that food that you that you have there and the character goes, oh, yeah, okay. And she shares her food with her and she goes, oh, thanks, that's great. Thank you so much. Okay, bye. And then she's gone. And it's completely inexplicable. And it's just this totally unexplainable unexplainable moment in terms of the way that we might ordinarily think about time or linearity or time and space, I suppose, right? People coming back from the dead. So one of my takeaways from this film is um, that we we live many lives. I had this really, um, about a week or so after this, my most recent rewatch, actually only a couple of days, sorry, afterwards, I was in the car, I was driving my uh, kids to pick up groceries and we were listening to the radio and it's... uh, it was a community radio station. It's our local station. So they play a lot of music from here and they played a song that I had recorded and released 15 years ago. Wow. It was really, really, it was really strange. It was, Mm. but in that moment, you know, my kids aren't that old. They'd like, this is a, this is a different life. I, I led a very, very different life back then when I made this piece of music and I hadn't even listened to it, um, you know, since it, I, it, it had been recorded and released. And it really, it kind of threw me a little bit. A, and it was like mm. um, a former memory or a ripple of... Like a time machine almost. Like a time machine. Like it, yeah. Yeah, it took you back. Yeah. yeah. And so that, that takeaway for me, you know, we live many lives 
And I think this film is Jessica on the precipice of a new life. I think she's mm. she's exiting and and, I, and it's not even as it doesn't even need to be as explicit as oh well Paul has died or um she decides she doesn't want to be an orchid farmer there's a there's a moment where she goes with her nan to look at the refrigerator and she decides in the moment she, we never really know whether she buys it or not but he's sort of saying to her oh if you, if the if the money is a problem then i can help you and she kind of shrugs him off and right. and brushes him off and they just kind of walk they walk off and then that's done and it's left behind and we have no idea whether she continues to be an orchid farmer or not i i think she's searching the whole way through the film she's searching she's trying to move somewhere she doesn't really know where and I think she's that is that this this where she where she arrives at the end, and I guess we can probably get to the 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 spoiler the of, very of, end. The, of spoiler. the the ship um, mm-hmm. as a means as an allegory for her movement into another life. Well, and I think that 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 is also. Um... I I think when I first saw it, my overwhelming impression at the end was about our smallness in the universe. Mm. It was about like almost gave me um, a sense of humility where it's like, you know, certain things like the Grand Canyon or the Great Wall right size you. That's a phrase that I hear a lot, right. being right-sized, right. where where we think that we're so important mm-hmm. and central mm-hmm. and that our lives are, um, you know, important. And when you're in certain settings that are majestic or that um, are awe-inducing, you all of a sudden realize your place, right? And you have like a a different interpretation of your own, not insignificance, but Mm. just the, the the level of space that you occupy suddenly is put into perspective, let's say. So when we see the spaceship at the end, to me, that is saying like your trauma, your emotions, your problems, like there's this whole other, uh, phenomena going on these things that are outside of you that are moving and and could make like they could render all of your current problems completely irrelevant uh if they encroach upon your reality you know and and so it's like just that humility of like oh you know there are things that i don't understand and there are things that I don't even know are going on. And maybe being in a posture all the time where I don't act like I know the answers would actually be more accurate, a more accurate way to live. I don't know. It just, it sort of inspires me t- to go along that trajectory of thinking. I'm completely with you. I think the idea that, as you say, We are not insignificant, but if we get a sense of ourselves, uh, this right sizing or this this scale of their things being beyond us, larger than us, and also things that we don't understand and we don't need to understand them. I, I think often we privilege this idea of and I also think that this is central to a picture pong cinema as well, um, is surrendering to this not knowing. Surrendering yeah. and being it's leaning into the mystery. Yeah. Yeah. And and, yeah. and letting the mystery be enough. Mm-hmm. It's very easy to get caught up in uh, elements of our lives that you know, I mean, look, we, we have to have jobs. We have relationships. Like if you want to be a person in the world, then you have to do certain things and be, there are certain responsibilities, for example. But I think, and I don't necessarily think the film is advocating for quitting your job and leaving your family. 
but I think it's advocating for putting the appropriate um, degree of importance on this surrender to the idea that you we don't have to have the answers all the time, we don't have to be in control all the time, um, and that there actually is a power in, well, yeah, for want of a better word, the, the surrender to those things that are beyond us, larger than us, you know. That, that, it's yeah. also it reminds me of a book by Anne Lamott that I read a while back, Help Thanks Wow. And that's she's literally saying that there are three ways of viewing the world that she has found to be the most useful. Um, asking for help when you need it, gratitude, saying thank you when you receive it, and then wow is the awe, you know operating in a sense of wonder, like you said. Um, and just like how unbelievable ordinary things are. A lot of times um, I think, you know, I obviously think a lot about addiction and I think a lot about the things that lure us and try to take us out. And I think a lot of times the attraction is that we want to feel things more intensely. But you can feel intensely about like a spider web, mm. if you want. You could feel intensely about uh, eating a peach. Like you, it does not have to be an escape for you, for us to be able to feel something deeply. But I think we associate a lot of things with getting out of reality instead of going in, moving towards and and allowing the ordinary to speak. And if we can pay attention and change the way that we view regular th phenomena, we would see that there's actually an element of the extraordinary in it, I think. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And the, that element of, well, look, I guess the, the film certainly just lets that breathe at the end. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. And there are just these moments of, and yeah, there are just these landscape shots and there's, there's, there's nothing right. there. There's no, there's no presence anymore. It's nature. Just, it's just, it, it yeah. just is, it's isness. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that is absolutely it. That is yeah, everything that you were explaining is encompassed in that. There it is. It's right there. I mean, it's also in, you know, there are also these moments of connection that she that she feels. Mm -hmm. You and I talk a lot about balance, right? Yes. And, you know, the balance of human connection as well as there is a lot of solitude in, in the film and solitude as, as healing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I think for a lot of people... And, you know, often we feel maybe, you know, being on your own, being in your own head, maybe isn't always the healthiest place to be. But right. if you can be present, if you can be in the moment, if you can shut out past or future, if you can just be there and experience whatever it is in that room or in that space or whatever it is that's around you, and just have that isness. That's all there is. And a lot of people have described memoria as meditation, and um, I think that that is apt. My my buddy Max kind of said that in his review that um, he thought memoria was a combination of memory and euphoria, mm -mm. like putting those two words together mm -mm. into memoria, and that that kind of resonated with me too, that maybe this euphoric state that we're all seeking, that the answer really is in that connection. And also our ability to sort of follow the sound in our ability to be on the path that where the maximum amount of what we're supposed to experience is present because we've 
gone the right way or gone the way that we're being led. Because I think as individuals, we all have, we have obviously so many options all the time of what direction to go in. But there's this movement, I think, or like a stirring of the soul a lot of times that I feel where if I am in alignment with where I think I'm supposed to be moving, the optimal amount of what I'm supposed to be receiving happens. And I I always know when it does. And I always know when I'm sort of closed off to that or not aware of that. So there's, yeah, it's it's very meditative in spirit. And I think it's trying to invite you to ponder if you're open. Absolutely. Just to get to Max's point about memory and euphoria. Um, yeah. That's an interesting one. Um, I, I looked it up and, well, obviously, memoria is the Spanish word for memory. So there's, there's right. that. But um, a memoria is almost also, also sort of like a shrine to memory. It's like a collection. Mm, like in memoriam. Sure. Yeah, that's right. So it's a yeah. collection of moments. And that obviously this film is that, has that. Um, but I feel like memory and euphoria almost could equal nostalgia. And I don't think mm. that this film is about nostalgia. No, I don't either. I, I think that the my emphasis is more just like bridging the two to where to where your memories are no longer causing you pain, but are actually leading to yes. a euphoric state. Yes. Maybe, yeah, yeah, for sure. Like constructive memory, like where you're able to edify or redeem, or you know, there's some sort of redemptive quality to it that that isn't just pain well i think um look cinema art uh whatever it might be is is a means for us to often is a means for us to reflect the world or reflect Mm. ourselves through the world to work through and that's the impression that i get you know of of what you're doing with amy's progress um in in trying to work through these ideas about and processing trauma, pain, grief, whatever it, it, it might be, because that is ultimately always connected and attached to memory, right? Um, mm-hmm. We have no, nothing else. Otherwise, the only thing that we have, again, we find ourselves, we're just back in this in the moment, right? Um, there's that duality again. There's that balance again. Yep. Right? That balance. Yeah. Adam Trainer, balance. The balance man. <laughs> sure. Well, uh, we're going to, I think we're going to end there, Adam. This has been uh, just a pleasure. I, f- I hope that uh, that anyone listening um, has gained some insight and that this sort of maximizes the film in some way. Um, but it is a powerful experience. It's a singular experience. And I'm glad that I was able to rewatch it this time with all the correct subtitles because before I didn't have that entire scene uh, when she goes in the jungle. Um, So thank you for that, Adam. But um, it's been a pleasure and I'm glad that you chose this. I think this was a perfect, perfect marker benchmark for where I'm at right now, especially too. Oh, thanks Amy. Thanks for having me back. I appreciate it. And you know, thanks for doing what you do. Yes. It's a pleasure. And thank you for listening. It's a pleasure to, to listen and it's a great pleasure to take part. Thanks. We'll see you guys at the movies.